My name is uh, Emmanuel Moss. Um, welcome to this panel on the social life of algorithmic harms. Um, like I said, I am Emmanuel Moss. I'm a joint postdoctoral scholar at Cornell Tech's Digital Life Initiative um, and here uh, on Data and Society's AI on the Ground Initiative. Um, I'm hosting this uh, workshop and this panel with my colleague, Jacob Metcalf, who is the program director for AI on the Ground at Data and Society. Um, and we're all supported today by uh, events colleagues, uh, CJ Brody Landau and Eli Ely, who are both behind this digital curtain. Um, we'll be spending the next hour together, so let's, let's get started. Um, as we begin, I'd like to tell you that Data and Society is an independent research institute. Together, we study the social implications of data and automation, um, and we produce original research to ground informed, evidence-based public debate about emerging technologies. Data in Society began where I happen to be today in New York City, uh, an island uh, in a network of hills and rivers in the Atlantic Northeast that is the ancestral land of the Lenny Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a vast array of servers and computer devices. In the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logics of white settler expansion. Um, and as an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. We commit to dismantling ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. To participate in this event, um, there is the regular Zoom functionality um, that I'm sure many of us are familiar with by now. Um, but to be specific, at the bottom of your screen, you can ask and upvote questions via the Q&A feature. You can um, select to use closed captioning for subtitles. You can view links and prompts in the chat window. I see some rolling in right now. Um, and I would like everybody to note that this event is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. I'm now going to turn it over to my co-host, Jake Metcalf, to put today's panel in context. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, really appreciate uh, all of the, the time and attention that has been uh, put into this event. Um, in addition to hosting today's uh, panel together, Manny and I are uh, also hosting an academic workshop tomorrow called The Social Life of Algorithmic Harms, um, bringing together researchers and practitioners to discuss works in progress and to build inter interdisciplinary connections um, that will strengthen this emerging field. Together, we'll help widen research frames and identify new categories of algorithmic harms, building the field to reflect uh, how these are social harms that aren't just bounded by the parameters of a technical system. Um, and travel in uh, unexpected ways through our social systems. Um, when selecting papers and participants for this workshop, we look for uh, work that centers lived experience, brings new, brings new disciplinary perspectives to bear on the identification and study of algorithmic harms, develops novel methodological approaches to describing and or measuring the scope of those harms, and that expands the scope of our understanding of who and what may be harmed by the operation of algorithmic systems. Um, this workshop is especially focused on work that suggests uh, ways of addressing algorithmic harms that do not fit into the categories already well established in the AI ethics and algorithmic fairness literatures. Um, when curating this workshop, we thought about who could speak further about how these algorithmic harms travel across fields of research and practice, communities and policies. Uh, so to help set the stage for this panel uh, and for tomorrow's academic workshop, we asked our keynote speakers here today, uh, Ali Al-Khatib, Margot Kaminsky, and Tawana Petty, um, the following question. What does it mean to encounter a new kind of harm and make it legible to others? Um, you can find their bios and their recorded uh, responses here in the chat. And I believe many of you have watched uh, the recorded uh, brief keynotes uh, that they provided to us. Um, at this point. Um, and so today we're thrilled to hold this live conversation with Ali, Margot, and Tuana uh, and open up space for questions uh, for everyone joining us as well. Uh, so first to introduce our keynoters um, is, uh, I'll just say a brief bio for everyone uh, and then we'll, we'll dive into questions. Um, so first, uh, up for us is uh, Ali Al-Khatib. He's the interim director for the center 
uh, for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. Uh, his work draws on theoretical frameworks from the social sciences to make sense of technical systems and ecologies from the perspective of people who experience them. Uh, Ali studied anthropology and informatics at UC Irvine and computer science at Stanford University as a PhD student. Uh, one piece of his work that uh, we really drew on uh, for framing uh, both the keynote and um, the, the workshop is his paper, Street Level Algorithms, that he co-wrote with uh, Michael Bernstein. So I'd recommend you check that one out. Um, next, we have Margot Kaminsky. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of Colorado Law School and director of the Privacy Initiative at Silicon Fat, Flat Irons. Uh, she specializes in the law of new technologies, focusing on information governance, privacy, and freedom of expression. Um, one piece of hers that drew our attention recently that we found really helpful in thinking about this workshop uh, is her paper, The Right to Contest AI, which was uh, co-written with Jennifer Urban. So again, check that one out. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have uh, Tuani, uh, excuse me, Tuana Honeycomb Petty, uh, who is a mother, social justice organizer, youth advocate, poet, and author. Uh, she's intricately involved in water rights advocacy, data and digital privacy rights education, and racial justice and equity work. Uh, she currently serves as the director of programs at Data for Black Lives, as former director of the Data Justice Program at the Detroit Community Technology Project, a former co-lead of our data bodies, a longtime convening member of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, and alumni fellow with Detroit Equity Action Lab. Uh, one work of hers that, uh, out of many, that we found very inspiring uh, is uh, from 2021, um, a really fascinating syllabus called From Protecting Ourselves to Taking Care of Each Other, a Curriculum for Building and Using Technology Consentfully, uh, which was, uh, co-authored with Una Lee um, and has a lot of uh, great organizations that uh, help support its publication. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn to um, our opening question for the day. Um, so I'd like to pose this actually to everyone um, and we'll, I'll take turns uh, calling on you. Um, so uh, I would like to ask a question that for the moment we can kind of frame as independent from the way data-driven uh, systems actually work. Um, and, and that's because it, it, in some ways it's kind of like a timeless question. Um, there's a long-standing tension between the particular and general when discussing how individuals and communities relate to dominant systems of power, right? On the one hand, we're trying to understand the specificity of a person who is harmed by something, uh, perhaps because they belong to a specific community or perhaps uh, because of other unique or deeply contextual circumstances. On the one hand, uh, we're trying to make sense of what it is, uh, uh, of what is happening to all of us as a society, even if the risks we face aren't evenly distributed so that we can together exert uh, some sort of control over the forces we see as powerfully and potentially dangerous. So we have this tension between um, when we're describing harms, we wanna be very particular and specific and recognize their deeply connect contextual nature. On the other hand, uh, we also want to find ways of creating solidarity, of creating a uh, common social cause um, and pushing for um, more just systems together. Um, from, uh, from the keynotes, uh, the pre-recorded key, uh, keynote lectures uh, from Ali, we heard about how it can be challenging uh, to not cause further harm by colonizing someone else's pain when doing scholarly work um, and how hard it is to actually listen and synthesize those lessons justly. Uh, for Margo, we heard about how the law makes some kinds of harms visible and contestable and not others, and how the law and regulations can enable the co-construction of harms more effectively. From Tawana, we heard how one community, Detroit, was able to understand both their own history of surveillance of oppressed communities and yet situate it within a broader call for algorithmic and racial justice outside of its own geographic boundaries. Um, and so what I want to ask the panelists now is uh, how do you, from the point of view of your way of being in the world and pursuing the work you do, make sense of this tension between needing to recognize the uni unique specificity of people's experiences um, and the broad shared need to manage and govern these harms collectively? How do you make this tension productive for you in your own work? Uh, so uh, I'll just go in the order that uh, the keynotes came in um, and uh, ask that to Ali first. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, um, 
yeah, I feel, I feel like I've had a lot of questions with, or a lot of conversations with people about this. And um, yeah, I guess you could say like the misgivings that people have as they work for tech companies doing this kind of work uh, while also feeling extremely uncomfortable about the kind of work that they've been doing. And I, I guess like maybe this is sort of like a not, <laughs> maybe this is not a very helpful sort of perspective, but I think that the like sort of work that I do or the way that I conceptualize my work is fundamentally trying to understand the shared fate of people who are experiencing these. And so I don't necessarily see like these orthogonal kind of directions to the work that I do. And I realize like that's sort of privileged on one hand because I'm in academia and I get to be somewhat sort of insulated from a lot of the sorts of pressures that uh, industry workers face and everything like that. But then there's also, uh, I, I think that like the kind of work that I do just fundamentally doesn't implicate the the precise kinds of uh, like uh, issues and dilemmas that, that a lot of people that I talk to uh, seem to face. I think that the answer that I tend to give people uh, when I, th I see that sort of difference of situation is to ask them to be conscientious about the power that they bring into the situation and to try to advocate as much as they can for the people that they are uh, trying to better understand. And sometimes that's going to mean to leave the job that they're at or to uh, insist and like to to boycott or to strike um, from the company that they're working for if it if it comes to that. Um, but to try to always uh, do what you can when you're in the room to get people to behave and to uh, to to move the structure that you're a part of to move the organization that you're a part of in a direction that uh, hurts fewer people uh, harm mitigation as much as possible. And uh, if that fails, then to not be a party to that to that system at all. Thank you. Um, uh, can I bounce this over to Margaret? Yeah, thank you. So I think one of the things that's so fascinating to me about participating in this, and I'm really grateful to be involved, uh, is that we are all coming to this from slightly different disciplinary perspectives, very different disciplinary perspectives. And when I hear your question, you know, what I hear is um, a number of repeating questions that come up often in the law uh, about the tension, for example, you know, this is, this is, way beyond algorithms. So the tension between um, having a system of law where an individual can sue because she was harmed um, versus a system of law where you rely on a centralized, usually before the fact regulator, uh, to protect people from harm. So classically, that breaks down into sort of a precautionary principle idea where you trust the centralized regulator to try to avoid harm on behalf of the collective. Um, versus the individual who uh, gets harmed, but then can seek compensation or recognition or however you conceive of the role of the legal system. Um, and I think that what, what I have seen in looking at the laws that are proposed for regulating algorithms so far, and some of them are actually in, in effect, yay Europe, um, is that uh, you know there, there tends to be, there is a tension uh, between on the one hand relying on some sort of collective approach to harm mitigation, which often will, by its nature, by the nature of the tool, characterize a harm as a risk, right? It's happening beforehand, and it's saying, um, this is a risk that we're looking at, we're going to calculate it across the population. Um, and then the other option is to, in some way, bestow an individual right, uh, which usually is going to take place after the fact. And the tension in this area of regulation is that, in some ways, the before the fact systemic, let's try to deal with this on a collective level approach is going to work better just by the nature of the technology um, and the practices. Uh, it'll affect, affect more people if you fix the tool beforehand, as you well know uh, from your work on impact assessments. Um, on the other hand, you know, there, there's something lost when you lose the individual. Um, you don't have the ability to seek compensation for a harm that's occurred to the individual. Um, you don't have an, uh, the ability to come in and contest and say, well, this might be on average better for the group, but for me personally, it was worse. Um, and you don't have the ability to speak and right speak, which I actually think is really important. You know, in, in Europe, when you talk about data protection, which we refer to as data privacy, um, you're talking about a con what's effectively a constitutional right. Um, and so to erase the individual and the individual harm from the picture, uh, is is a non-starter, where in the United States, when we see regulatory regimes around algorithms, we very much see a focus on the collective um, because we don't have this kind of constitutionalized right. 
Thank you for that. And yes, we are definitely coming from very different perspectives, but I do see a through line, right? I see, I see the desire to figure out how to recenter the community um, in some way, shape or form. And for me, I'm coming from the community perspective. I mean, I will be um, up front and say now that I've been working, technically working in these sort of industries um, and in nonprofits that are doing this type of social justice work, um, it draws a, a, a different kind of a line from when I was the community member who was just shouting at the community meetings. And so now I'm the community member who's shouting at the community meetings, but also now trying to figure out how to leverage resources that I now have access to, to um, put those tools like the Consentful Tech curriculum, the digital defense playbook, and these other things in the hands of community members. And so uh, my approach has been multifaceted. Um, it's coming from you know, my lived experience uh, of looking out my window and seeing surveillance helicopters or surveillance drones or um, mass surveillance in my community to being in uh, conversations around what legislative policy could be, uh, you know, potentially passed to mitigate the harms. And so one thing I've had to do is go from, you know, sometimes having, I want a ban on face recognition is a perfect example, but I've learned that based on uh, community members, um, specific, you know, circumstance, like the ways they see safety, as an example, um, I might not be able to get to that conversation right away. And so you have to be able to have uh, varying levels of dialogue and understand that um, there is no one approach to how to engage in harmful uh, conversations around harmful systems. And I've really learned that in working with data analysts and ethicists and, and everyone else is like, you know, uh, there aren't necessarily always opportunities to sit and think about the impact, the human impact of the innovation that's happening or the, the, the formulas that are being crunched or you know whatever language uh, technologists use uh, when they're in a particular field. However, there I think there always has to be that built in, whether it's a set of questions or principles or values that folks in the field have to stop and think about um, I think there has to be a way to systemically put that into the conversation because otherwise it'll never come into the conversation. And we're getting to the point where mitigating harms is becoming in, nearly impossible um, or, you know, unattainable. And so, um, yeah, it, it really is. It's, this is a perfect example. This is a microcosm of what needs to happen. These different approaches need to be in conversation all the time. And so, yeah, I'll leave it there because there's so much more that could be said. Uh, thank you so much. I think we're gonna bounce it over to Manny for uh, some individual questions. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you for that that uh, round robin. Um, I think there's there's so much to talk about. Um, so I hope we get some chance for some, some lively back and forth. But bef before we get all the way there, um, I wanted to ask Ali first, um, if you could reflect a little bit more on something you discussed in your talk uh, about the lessons anthropology specifically learned or kind of sort of learned in um, what, what we as anthropologists call the post-colonial turn um, that those of us thinking about algorithmic harms might need to learn in similar ways. Um, I'm thinking in particular about the ways in which research on how people live their lives um, has historically and continues to be used to serve power um, and the way ethnographic work in studying human and computer interactions um, can certainly be used in ways that are incredibly useful to powerful deliver, developers uh, seeking ways to improve their products ability to bring people under their control, um, often in ways that subordinate people to machinic logics. Uh, so my question is, um, I'm wondering if there are lessons you think can be learned um, by those of us working in such spaces today uh, from the way anthropology as a discipline has come to terms with how its research has served power. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I feel like I have, uh, I don't know, slightly fire, um, but that's for the best, I suppose. Um, I, I mean, I think that like one of the things that anthropology did that uh, I would like to see computer science or design or HCI do is to confront more directly the role of, uh, I mean, the military for one thing, but just like industry broadly as a major underwriter of the kinds of work that um, 
that we see in academia and in conferences and in journals and whatnot. Um, I think that like we are really worryingly um, resistant to have conversations about the fact that Google, who fired Tim Gebru and uh, uh, Margaret Mitchell, um, like is one of the, I think it is like the hero sponsor or whatever the, the phrase is for the leading HCI conference. And like, I'm just, you know, preparing for whether to go to that conference or not. And I'm like looking at all of the sponsors and it's a lot of, a lot of companies that, you know, should not should not have a presence at the conference at all to say nothing of the fact that like we shouldn't be elevating them. Um, and I think that that motivates a lot of the kind of research that we see and all of the kinds of harms that we see coming out of our own field. And we need to confront that as as a first step. Um, but I think that one thing that and I think that that's something that anthropology sort of partially, I would say, tried to do in confronting the role that they played. Uh, I mean, one in, in World War II, but um, especially in the Cold War, uh, as as human intelligence and anthropology uh, started to become more of a started to play more of a role in in the Cold War in particular. And I think um, so I think that like one thing that we just need to have a conversation about is the is the role that people intentionally uh, play in in systems of power, but then also the I guess I would say like the inadvertent ways that the that the things that we do, the things that we work on, can be used to cause and further harm. Um, and so I think that that's one major area. I think that another major thing that we need to focus on is less on things like bias and more on things like harm, uh, because it is true that bias tends to be one of the undercurrents of harm. But it should be enough that somebody was harmed, that somebody is hurt, that causes us to stop like it shouldn't matter that our system was unbiased like or ha like past all of the checks of bias uh, in in whatever system we're we're developing um and i think like that's the sort of like we're in a very early stage of like fairness accountability transparency things like that uh and i think i would like to, us to start to move more towards well what is the experience of the people that we are working with and like setting aside whether we think that we followed all the procedures or not like did we actually did like are people worse off after our intervention or after our arrival. Um, I think that uh, one of the last thoughts that I sort of have before I, I cede back to the to all of you is, um, I mean, I think that anthropology as a field sort of broadly, correctly identified that uh, deconstructing the knowledge that sort of is the foundation of anthropology this long ongoing process it's it's like it's it is a long project and it is an it is an endless project and so we're never going to be done with this this work of trying to extricate ourselves and distance ourselves from the kinds of harm of the military industrial complex of surveillance capitalism of the carceral state because that is a very much a big part of what hci and computing is and we can't we can't really like shed that the reality of that history from us but what we can do is we can constantly work to to do better and to uh, right some of the harms that we've done and to start to heal some of the the injustices that that we've caused. Thanks for that, Ali. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Jake for the next question. Uh, this is a question for Margot. Uh, so something you mentioned in your um, keynote and a, a theme running through uh, some of your legal scholarship um, is this idea that um, preventing algorithmic harms uh, requires a, a concept of um, co-construction where the legal um, uh, structures, the, the, the legal concepts, the, the regulatory powers uh, that the federal government has um, would uh, be bent towards uh, empowering the people who are harmed by algorithmic systems to um, say what the problem is, right? To actually have the voice uh, of uh, the people who are impacted by these systems uh, be part of the process of constructing the legal apparatus that is able to, that, that theoretically, possibly, hopefully in the future uh, would um, empower us to have significantly more control over how these systems um, impact our lives. Um, but the, the, the question that we struggle with a lot, actually, uh, as folks who also use this uh, social concept co-construction, um, is like, how do you know it when you see it? How do you get federal agencies to see these harms? Um, what do they have to do in order to be able to hear from people who are being harmed um, or might be harmed by a proposed future system? Um, what, what are the avenues that are available in the law, in the administrative state, um, absent a private right of action 
um, or other way of other ways of getting harms into court. I mean, like computational harms are notoriously hard to achieve standing uh, in courts. So, like, what are what's your what's your vision for how the regulatory state, administrative state, could actually um, approach something like co-construction of of algorithmic harms and the regulatory apparatus to um, resolve them? Yeah. So I wish I had the perfect answer. Right. Like, I think this is this is the research agenda. Um, and I'd say that if I were offering you the perfect answer, you should be very skeptical of me, um, because in part, uh, this is something that has just repeatedly been gotten wrong. I guess I'm kind of echoing Ali in this one. Right. Like it's it's that we have so many examples of companies being told. I mean, you know, think of like international human rights impact assessments, right? Um, companies or countries being told, you know, you should conduct a self, some navel gazing about the kinds of, um, of harms that you're gonna cause. You should try to mitigate those harms. We'll have some oversight, we'll have some conversations. Uh, and, you know, that by itself tends not to work very well. So I have several different answers to you of what I think doesn't work. Um, and then maybe a couple of, of points of hope. So I think it does not work, and this should be obvious to everybody, but it's not obvious in the laws that are being proposed, to give companies the ability to just go through a checklist internally. Um, you know, basically say like, all right, we've we've done, we've looked into this, we've done the, the harm mitigation, and we're finished. And you'd be surprised, I mean, you won't, but uh, many might be surprised how many laws propose this and just keep it entirely internal to a company. Um, and the idea is, you know, we lean heavily on the ethics of the people within that company, we lean heavily on the compliance infrastructure within that company, and we all know, you know, see Enron, that doesn't work. Um, so then the question is, you know, how do you get voices in and how do you get voices out? Um, and to get voices in and get voices out, you have to you have to construct channels of communication, and you have to do it pretty deliberately. And it's going to be incredibly context specific. Uh, so this is the other reason why I think we have to be really skeptical of somebody coming in and saying, "I have the answer; it's here." Um, it might be context specific by the type of harm. It might be context specific by the particular company or agency, as you asked. Um, it might be context specific by how much expertise is needed to participate in the conversation. But some examples of things that are good by in my book uh, is that the more eyes you can get, the more di diverse eyes, both in terms of stakeholder diversity and expertise diversity that you can get over the operations of a system, the better. And the more power you can give those people to give feedback uh, that has force to um, whoever it is who's using or creating the system, the better. And then the counter arguments you're going to hear that always come up are a combination of we don't want to reveal company or proprietary secrets. Um, we don't want to allow people to then game the machine. Um, and, uh, you know, some other host of, uh, of, of things about people won't understand it, it's a waste of time, um, and, and a very real concern that this will result in ethics washing, right? If you, you create the opportunity for somebody to look at it and all you're doing is process um, and uh, you're not really giving them much power, then all you're saying is, you know, they looked at it, it's, it's fine, right? This community approved it. Um, and we see that happening on the like local level of community involvement and in policing all the time. Um, so my my points of hope. So um, you know I do I'm a comparativist. I look at comparative law, and uh, when I looked at the European General Data Protection Regulation versus the newly proposed EU AI Act, what was very striking to me is that the GDPR does not require. Um, that companies in conducting impact assessments conduct uh, impact assessments with stakeholder involvement. They highly suggest it. It basically says, uh, let me see if I got the exact language, where appropriate, um, the controller shall seek the views of data subjects. So on the one hand, that's you have to go talk to people. On the other hand, it's only where appropriate. Um, when you look at the EU AI Act, it says nothing. There's nothing there requiring a company conducting an impact assessment for the use of AI to consult anybody external. Um, when you look, however, at two proposed laws from in the United States, so there's a, a bill in Washington state and there's the Wyden Algorithmic Accountability Act, uh, sorry, it's Wyden, um, Booker and Clark. Um, and that, the Wyden law, uh, Wyden, Booker and Clark, Clark law, I'll just refer to it as the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which is a proposed law. 
um, requires companies to consult with impacted stakeholders. And if they don't take the, the, um, the voices into account, they don't take uh, the kinds of harms that were highlighted into account, they have to explain why they didn't do that. Um, and then the Washington bill, which applies, would apply only to SB 5116, which would apply only to uh, public agencies, not to companies, um, requires the, the uh, government rulemaker that's going to come up with the standards for these accountability reports or impact assessments to consult, again, I think the language is um, with representatives of communities whose rights are disproportionately impacted by the automated decision system. So. Uh, what I would counsel us to think about as we're looking to how to do co-construction well through the law is not to get too hung up on any one mechanism and to be looking at the system as a whole to make sure you have channels of input and channels of output and transparency. Um, if you get too hung up on the one thing, like just the impact assessment, then you can get stuck in a place where the impact assessment effectively becomes ethics, ethics washing. That that was great, Margaret. I'm starting to see some some lines of connection between the other comments. Like uh, especially, especially this frame of voices in, voices out is is really helpful. And I'm kind of uh, in my head putting that through uh, the insight Tuana had that many people don't even have time to think about these, let alone think about how other people are thinking about these issues. So I'd love to I'd love to come back to this when we're when we're having a more open uh, conversation after um, I ask uh, Tuana uh, the question I've, I've prepared. Um, in reference to her, her lovely keynote, um, which is about um, what you mentioned in your keynote about abolishing Dr. King's evil triplets of racism, militarism, and materialism. Uh, a little bit of a hard right turn from, from a legalistic conversation, but um, what I wanted to ask was that, um, okay, so specifically each of these isms that uh, construct these evil triplets is really central to the technology discussed. And each of these triplets reinforces the other in insidious ways, um, technologically and socio-technically. Um, and so one of the things I take from your talk in part is that um, technologies like those associated with Project Greenlight or ShotSpotter are inherently harmful, e evil even, um, in and of themselves. And so it seems strange for us in this conversation that we're having to try to enumerate and mitigate the harms produced by such technologies. Um, so I'd love it if you could speak a little bit to how you think about engaging with these technologies as, as objects that might be better or worse if they're so closely aligned um, with these evil triplets. Um, are there contexts where these tools aren't evil? Um, are there moves available to society beyond refusal to engage with or grapple with these technologies? Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say uh, I have to give myself credit, y'all. I'm laying here with a broken ankle. So if you see me twisting and turning, <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know, I I'll say this. I think that the uh, technology movement or the ethics movement within technology and data has to take seriously the abolitionist movement and start to think about ways that, that can they can start to uh, be interwoven into how we think about what needs to exist in society. Um, a perfect example is like in movement, a lot of us say all the time, I'm trying to work myself out of a job. So your, your, your job exists because there are harms. And so your goal is to really work yourself out of having to do that type of work. But unfortunately, under those evil triplets, what happens is we can lose sight of that. Um, and especially when you're developing new systems or, or you don't have a connection with community and you're starting to think about what you think should exist in the world, um, if you're not thinking about those harms, as Ali was saying, then you end up replicating them or you end up creating new harms. And then that makes me have more job security in doing work that I really shouldn't have to be doing. <laughs> Um, and so it really is an interrogation of those evil triplets and saying like, number one, what needs to exist in the world? Number two, what are we replicating that is historic uh, uh, or a, a historical harm? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Simone Brown's book, Dark Matters, where she talks about the 18th century lantern laws. And here I am in Detroit with Project Greenlight Mass Surveillance. And there are so many similarities 
um, in these systems and somebody created Project Greenlight because they don't understand what safety is and because they don't have that historical analysis and because they're not having that harm reduction question. Um, and so they're in a lab somewhere creating something that they think um, with an internalized carcerality mindset um, is going to create safety in a community. And I always say surveillance ain't safety. <laughs> and I use ain't on purpose because um, it, it, it really, I really want it to be impactful. It's like these are, the communities are saying we want to feel safe. They're not saying we want to be watched. We want to be tracked. We want to be surveilled. And that's with any system. Even if you think about COVID and contact tracing, right? Folks want to be safe from COVID. They don't want to be tracked and have all their friends tracked and have all their uh, people on their job and like, you know, folks they visited or what store they, you know, they don't want to enter all everybody in their uh, network into some database to be weaponized against them later. And so um, it really is about having those deeper dialogues and, and putting those stop gaps in place where you can ask those questions. How does this historically tie to harms that have already been created? And if the abolitionist movement is talking about carcerality, what are what are what are the things that I'm working on contributing to that? Is it for the better or is it for worse? Um, and I can keep on. <laughs> there's so much I can say, but I, I think hopefully you all get the point of what I'm trying to make. Um, yeah, I, I think we do, and I, I think we'd also be okay if you went on for for the rest of the time that we have available. Um, <laughs> but I want to I want to kind of um, I guess I want to uh, follow up on an on an earlier thread of this conversation that ties in some of the things that you were just mentioning. Um, so I wanna, I wanna think about what you mentioned about seeing how people work inside these companies and how they don't even have time to think about a lot of these issues. Um, something I saw in my own research and Jake and I saw when we were interviewing people like this as well was that um, when they do have time to think about these issues, they're getting together in rooms um, where um, they're thinking about what they're building um, and how it might affect people whose lives are very, very different from their own, um, being all technologists themselves in that room. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you have thoughts about how, um, what Margo was saying, how more voices can get into this like development process, how more ears can be open to those voices um, and, that, and what that might look like from, from the work that you've done um, wearing any of the hats that you've worn. Yeah, uh, I think the voices are, is very important. Just even being invited to this type of a dialogue, right, where it really could be um, uh, folks who might not necessarily be uh, con considered frontline community members. And I use that loosely because I really think that we have the potential to be a frontline community member, depending on what type of community we're engaged in. And so I like the fact that Timnit was uh, leveraged as an example, right? Um, she definitely is a frontline uh, community member who took on uh, an ex establishment tech, um, tech corporation um, and then created an alternative vision. And so I think that, um, having the, these dialogues where we all get to advance our language, whether it's me learning more about the systems that um, within law or within technology, or whether it's folks learning more from me about what the direct harms are of having your community massively surveilled or, um, or uh, living under a city where there's been a half century of propaganda assault, which really dictates the policies that are implemented in your community. And so I think the more well-versed we are, on each other's experiences, the more we can start to see ourselves in each other's shoes. Um, and then that gives us a more humane way of engaging with these systems. And so I really do think it's more voices, um, more experiences uh, lead to a deeper level of humanity um, and understanding. And then it makes you want to, when you, I, I'll finally say this, if you live in a neighborhood where you're driving straight into your garage and you go straight into your house and you have no idea who lives on your street, you're going to think less about what's happening to your neighbor. That's just the reality. And so when you get to the point where you're humanizing people, um, and that has been shown in every movement, when you get to the point of humanizing people, you start to ask questions. It just inherently happens. Like, am I doing anything that's going to hurt that person that I know very well that lives next door to me? And that's what we need to happen in um, tech and data spaces um, and corporations and any industry, honestly, law enforcement, um, if you're seeing the people in front of you as human, 
then you try to mitigate harm. It's just a natural reaction to humanizing people. I love that. I officially wish we had doubled the amount of time we have to have this conversation. Um, Cause I, I wanna talk more about all of that. Um, but I think that a question from the audience um, does a good job of that. I'm going to kick it to Jake to ask that question um, and hopefully it'll, it'll extend this theme. Sure, uh, I mean, thank you so much uh, from uh, the panelists uh, for answering our questions. And now we're going to turn it over to the audience a little bit. Um, so first I'm gonna ask um, Jenna Burrell's question. Um, she writes, I notice voice is a theme in all of your keynotes. Ali, on the idea, on the idea that anthropologists have of themselves as giving voice and the skepticism that comes with that. Uh, Margo on how those affected by algo systems co-constructing what a harm is to the opportunities for voice uh, in and out of the judicial system. Uh, Tawana and voices being heard in community-led activism. Uh, is voice always a counterforce outside of and against algorithmic systems? How does voice get co-opted in each of your areas? So I sort of read this as a question about like, are, are there some risks of voice? Um, how do we know when we're using voice uh, in a way that that's productive and actually contributes to justice? Yeah, I can start since I think my name came up first. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, like when I saw the question, I, I was thinking about it and I think I sort of went on two tracks. So the first thought was, uh, I think that voice comes up a lot in a lot of our work because uh, algorithmic harms are so difficult to identify in part because they act upon people in ways that the people don't necessarily realize that they're being acted upon as part of like a broader category. So um, one example that I have written about in the past has been um, YouTube demonetizing trans YouTubers videos for just mentioning gender identity and their titles and descriptions um, and demonetizing it as sexually explicit. Uh, I think that if you didn't have a community of trans YouTubers who were talking to each other and who were trying to basically kind of exchange notes on like what's going on with this thing that's happening to me, um, it wouldn't have been as easy to identify that this is part of a class of harms that's happening. So I think like just identifying that and listening to people who are talking about what they're experiencing and then being able to piece together those broader patterns is really difficult, but it is one of the things that we kind of have to do in, in studying algorithmic harms and uh, thinking about algorithmic justice. And then the other thought is, yeah, uh, voices definitely get co-opted um, in really egregious and uh, like terrible ways. Um, one way that recently was, uh, I forgot the exact context for like the exact, the circumstances, but there was somebody, um, I think it was like a project manager at Google who was talking about like what it might be like to, for, uh, I think it was like something like an algorithm, an algorithmic system like has a sense of what it is like to be blind or something like that. It was like this really upsetting, uh, like sort of parallel that, that he was drawing in like this sort of long running blog post or something. And, um, and it really elicited this idea of uh, like corporations and these other groups and everything like that, basically using uh, people with disabilities as sort of like the excuse to harm other groups or pitting different groups against each other. And uh, I think like that is one of the really common ways that I see um, like people's voices being co-opted. And like you see this a lot in like a lot of PR campaigns and things like that. Like a company will elevate somebody from a marginalized group and sort of say like, well, this person's getting the benefit of, you know, mass surveillance. And so like, do you really want to hurt that pe like that group of people? And it's like, no, of course not. But like, clearly you're creating this false dichotomy where I have to accept that like we, I don't know, do like that we like enhance some terrible technology or something like that for the benefit of this one group at the cost of so many others. And that's this sort of like Faustian or sort of like false dichotomy bargain that that these companies tend to tend to do um, often using, uh, yeah, marginalized groups as uh, as like tokens and as scapegoats and things like that. So this is a wonderful question and you should write this essay, Jenna. Um, so uh, I'll be brief um, because I really wanna hear what Tawana has to say on this. Um, so yes, co-opting happens. Uh, one example of this, uh, I think in terms of legal structure is from the GDPR where the guidelines say, if you wanna get input from stakeholders, conduct a Qualtrics survey in so many words. And so you imagine like, oh yeah, the stakeholders are really having a chance to participate in that by sitting here and filling out the bubbles. Um, 
So uh, there are many ways in which input can be structured so as to make voices, render voices ineffective. Um, the other thing that I'd say, which is a little bit more complicated and not what you asked, is that there can be tensions, like substantive tensions between um, trying to create processes for allowing voices in and substantive outcomes someone might normatively think as a you know, predisposed matter are good. Um, so to, to bring this up, this happens in the environmental context all the time. Um, so, you know, you have uh, communities that are impacted by enormous amounts of pollution and historically, uh, often these are historically marginalized, marginalized communities of color uh, being brought in to discuss what's going to happen to this factory, for example, that's, you know, in your area spitting out all this pollution. And there may be countervailing uh, interests from that community where they come in and say, you know what, pollution's fine. I really want to make sure I have a job. Um, and so, you know, in, in saying that voice needs to be considered, I want to make sure that we are not, um, uh, we're not wetting ourselves to particular outcomes uh, and that we're understanding that there's going to be tension between allowing for justice in the sense of community participation and particularly participation by impacted communities um, and, you know, sometimes the normative results that people uh, participate in the level of legal design might be predisposed to think are right. Ashe, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I live that every day. You know, uh, one of my late mentors, Grace Lee Boggs, would always say people are not a school of fish. Um, and so, you know, you aren't going to you, you can talk to 10 different groups on the same day all have similar backgrounds, incomes, racial demographics, everything, and get a different proposed solution. That's why I think political education is so important. That's why I think historical analysis is so important. And one of the things that I learned through organizing in Detroit is that the more information people have, the more consensus you tend to have towards systems that can be proven harmful. And so um, the educational component, which is different than schooling, <laughs> um, the educational component um, is, is very important. And if, if folks don't understand the systems that they're up against, and I don't mean they don't know what's happening to them. I mean, an intricate understanding of how this system came to be and historically how it has created harm in the past, it makes it very difficult to speak out against it. And so that's one of the things that I learned consistently when a carceral system is being imposed on a community that has been disinvested in, that ha has high quality of life crime, right? Because there's so much poverty that has suffered under a half century of targeted propaganda assault. And so you have people who are going to ask for systems that ultimately are going to invade their privacy, um, uh, keep them exposed to more uh, you know, uh, incarceration. I don't want to say opportunities, but you know, uh, lead them into uh, uh, various forms of incarceration, whether it be tethers or, or prison. Um, and worse, right? But if you if you're continuing to go to a community meeting, you're bringing the the research and you're bringing uh, digestible, accessible information and historical analysis, then you start to see a shift in the ways that people are engaging. Now they might not always come to your side of things, but they'll definitely start to ask deeper questions. And so that when I when I think about voice, I think about how many more voices are gonna come in a room that are gonna be able to ask questions that allow for them to think critically about any given subject. And so as long as our communities can think critically, can ask questions, have um, access to information, then we've done our job um, in increasing voice within a space. It doesn't mean, um, as uh, Margot was just saying, it doesn't mean that you're predicting an outcome, but it's not fair for a community to, um, to have something waged against them and they don't have all the information. Thank you for that. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be thinking about that for, for quite some time. Um, the next question from the audience kind of sets this conversation about voice um, maybe on edge a little bit. Um, and I also really like, uh, really appreciate how it's written. So I'm going to just read it verbatim. It's from Sarah Bergstresser. Um, she writes, I also have a question about the concept of speaking for others. Uh, as a person with a disability and also an academic, but not a lawyer, I would definitely want an attorney to speak for me in many situations, such as in court. Um, that is because they do not, uh, they, they do speak right to speak uh, in the needed way and I don't. 
This is not obliterating my voice. This is enhancing my voice in a particular context via collaboration. I wonder if we can think of ways to reconfigure and contextualize this speaking for concept as a collaboratory process um, that can shift over time and so also takes continu continuous work. Can't we have a more relational autonomy approach to the concept of voice? I'm interested if the panelists have some ideas of how we can talk, uh, start talking more about guidelines for ethical collaboration rather than decontextualized discomfort. Um, and really whoever wants to unmute first should, should go for it. I guess I did. Um, yeah, I really love this framing. Um, I, I think like in my like street level algorithms paper, like one of the things that we were sort of drawing on was this idea of, I mean, like very explicitly street level bureaucrats broadly, but also thinking a lot about uh, like judges and advocates and bureaucratic institutions like the criminal legal system and and courts and things like that. And um, I mean, like, so this is sort of like behind the scenes, but like one of the things we were thinking about go, like uh, kind of working on right after the street level algorithms paper was basically working on a system that would uh, act as an advocate for the person who was trying to challenge the initial algorithmic decision. So let's say that somebody had their video demonetized and they wanted to understand why an algorithmic system that was sort of designed basically intentionally adversarially to the original one uh, would try to seek out uh, like basically try to seek out uh, examples or sort of similar cases or something like that. And this in, in this case, we were actually like kind of explicitly drawing on the idea of like, if you have an advocate for you, well, one of the other structures that you have in a court sort of criminal justice sort of context is like the uh, idea of disclosure. Like you have to have access to evidence. Um, you have to have access to past precedent. Like you have to be able to reference things. So that should be a prerequisite as well. Um, and yeah, so like, I just really love this framing because it, it, in introduces all of these social structures that we need to be thinking about as, well, do we need to have as a prerequisite to, to any kind of algorithmic justice, this understanding that there needs to be some party that is advocating for the person who was harmed? Um, I don't think that that is currently the case. Uh, it's not built in structurally into like algorithmic systems right now, um, but I think that that arguably should be. And I really love that the if we if we sort of draw on uh, the legal system, we see all of these structures that exist uh, because of social norms and all and and uh, legal uh, requirements that uh, give just really interesting inspiration to the kinds of things that we could that we could imagine building um, both socially and and technologically. Tawana, you're next. Go ahead. I was going to lift up an example that we tried in Detroit called the Detroiters Bill of Rights. And um, it was really, you know, it, it was, it was, we didn't win, but we made a lot of progress and we educate a lot of people, but um, we were pursuing things like right to sanitation, right to environmental health, right to safety, uh, right to be free from di discrimination, right to access and mobility, right to housing. The reason why I want to lift up some of the things we were pursuing is because we ensured that those rights were drafted by people who were most impacted by those systems. So right to access and mobility was uh, the entire cohort of people drafting that. That legislation were people who live with disabilities every day and chronic illnesses. Right to housing were folks who are housing insecure or unhoused. Right to uh, affordable water were folks who have lived without water, et cetera. And we all came together and it, you know, it's not easy. Coalition work is not easy. However, it's very important that if you're trying to create a quote unquote solution uh, for a community that that community has a say in how that solution is being developed. And a lot of times what we get is, you know, those buzzwords, community engagement. Uh, and I think we touched on it earlier where, you know, industry gets to say, well, we did some community engagement, which means they tapped into the same 10 people that they reach out to all the time um, that they know aren't gonna really take them to task. Uh, and so, uh, this was a slow three-year process um, of being, you know, not having always um, uh, good outcomes at the ends of meetings, but it was very important if we're going to create a systemic solution that we're able to return to the table and hear what people are saying about how they're experiencing these particular systems. Now, I might at some point in my life have been housing insecure. I might have uh, also experience not having water at points of my life, but who is dealing with that system right now? And uh, how can their voice be uh, a contributing factor to ensuring that we don't replicate those harms and that we can create a system that's more healthy and humane in the future? And so that collaborative, 
um, that type of collaboration is necessary for the future we all think uh, we deserve and uh, the future I, I think we deserve. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I'll add again, I guess it's the attorney's perspective, though I, I'm, it's dangerous for me to claim to be an attorney since I, you know, am largely a teacher. Um, my two reactions to this question were, yes, capacity enhancement is crucial. Right, like one of the big problems here, and we heard this in Tawana's previous remarks, um, is making sure that you don't just have voice, but you have voice that is informed, um, and the voice that is that can understand the systems that that you know people are being asked to weigh in on. Um, but the other thing that came to mind, which I actually have not thought much about, when I think of the attorney-client relationship, the first thing that comes to mind is a duty of loyalty, and. When largely in this space, when I've heard about capacity enhancement, it hasn't come with this understanding of like you should have loyalty to the people who really whose voice you really want to be heard. Like an attorney is supposed to take the back seat to your rights, right? Make your rights look better in front of the court and help you win. Um, but it's not the attorney's rights, it's your rights. So that brought a different spin on this to me that I think actually might be worth thinking about. There is something I'd just like to chime in about. Um, Tawana mentioned like that you like sometimes you go to the same like group of people that you always go to, and you end up hearing sort of the same things all the time. And like I explicitly have this like experience um, where, and it wasn't even like we intentionally went to the same people every time. It was just we like we tried to recruit people to help us with a like a, a gig work platform, like a cooperative kind of like gig work platform that we were building. And it was the people who were most amenable to working with like Microsoft Research and then later Stanford. And like, of course, that's a biased group. And uh, like, so it wasn't even like it was sort of an intentional thing on our part. It's just, it's just sort of like who responded and then that created like that sort of bias. And then there was the the second thing that was sort of like, I mean, they don't, they just don't necessarily want to like destroy the like sort of relationship that they have with us by saying like what you're doing, it's completely wrong. I remember I was doing like some, some sort of like ongoing work with a group uh, in Seattle and it took like two months before anybody told us that, um, like before anybody felt comfortable telling us that putting like a photo of the of the domestic worker in the like in the profile might be a little bit like challenging because some people are trying to escape domestic violence and like they don't want their photo out on the web or like they don't want their photo like even in the app before the person like actually interacts with them. And like that was something that took like several months for them to feel comfortable telling us about, I think because they were worried that we would sort of say like, oh, this group's difficult or something. And so like, of course, they're going to be sort of more cooperative or more like more polite or something like that. When in reality, like you have to seek out people who might not be as like amenable to like the project that you're working on. And you, you actually have to listen to them and like, like listen to what they're saying and, and take their feedback into account. Ali, I just really want to quickly say to your point, you have to be willing to accept no and actually not do the thing. <laughs> And there isn't enough room for not doing the thing. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, everything you just said. Uh, okay, so we are getting close to time. Um, we had one last question to ask each panelist to answer as briefly as possible. Um, before we wrap up, what's one thing to remember from uh, your keynote and or today's panel uh, that we can take into the workshop tomorrow um, and into our work and communities back wherever uh, we uh, have our communities. Um, Ali. Um, I think that the major thing that I would want people to uh, understand is that you, like, you will and what somebody else's life is or is like, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't constantly be working towards listening and uh, and trying to empathize and trying to be present with them um, just because it is a perpetual like endless project doesn't mean that it is hopeless it's like that is that is life um, uh, and uh, so like as difficult as it is as humbling as it is and as as like I don't know as like far away as that goal is always going to be that doesn't mean give up that just means it's like you're just going to keep going Margo. I don't have anything nearly as deep as that. Um, <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, so, you know, I would say I have I have two points that I, I think are important to think about when thinking about policy in this space. 
Um, the first is that I think individual rights really matter. Um, I think whether or not it's a private right of action, whether it's a private right to sue, uh, I think that it's a mistake to throw them out altogether because individual rights can serve as a form of voice, right? They don't have to be the only one, they shouldn't be the only one, um, but they they can serve as an important form of voice. Uh, and my shorter, uh, snarkier version of this is, please let's not just think about impact assessments. Um, is, is that a subtweet of Manny and my work? <laughs> uh, 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 to, uh, one last thing, Tuana, please. Oh, do we do we lose Tuana? We are we are at time. If we we, did, we did lose her, um, we'll just have to treat this like a cliffhanger, um, waiting for what she might have said. Oh wait, oh. there she. Is. Tuana, would I you like to? Have... Yes, I dropped off. Uh, yay! Um, um, <laughs> You're I... almost done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will just say that. Um, you, I, I'll lift up my late mentor again and say, sometimes the questions are more important than the answers. And I think we, we just have to keep asking deeper questions. And I think that'll get us to being, uh, to creating more humane tools to, to stay committed to true engagement with one another um, and to, to creating the world um, that actually to rescuing the world from, <laughs> from the demise that we're seeing happen because there isn't enough slow, um, conversation about what needs to exist in the world. So thank you all for having me. Thank you all for being here, um, each one of you. Um, this is where we have to stop for today. Um, there are some really good, excellent questions still lingering in the Q&A. Um, we're going to try and preserve those um, as best we can. Um, thank you to everyone who's gathered here uh, with us during this hour, wherever you're joining us from, um, and to everyone who's going to watch this afterwards. Um, huge appreciation to our speakers today, Ali Al-Khatib, Margot Kaminsky, and Tawana Petty. Um, you can go to dataandsociety.net to check out their illustrated keynote talks. They're live illustrated, they're fun, um, along with uh, this conversation and some other resources. Uh, it'll be up as soon as possible. Uh, workshop attendees who are in the audience, uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow um, and diving even deeper into this topic, into these topics. Uh, thank you so much and take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Recording stuff.